Well, good morning. Happy summer. My name is Cor. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, I would love to meet you after the service today. Uh, this is the part of the service where we open up God's word and we ask him to speak to us and to communicate um, his message, his message of rescue and salvation. And it is different than the world's messaging. It is contrary. It, it might feel upside down. And so uh, it, it's important for us, I think, to, to sit before the Lord and just humbly ask God speak. God, show us. Show us where you are distinct from, unique compared to the philosophies and teachings of the world, the, the ways that the world says, you need salvation, you need rescue. Here's how you can help yourself. Jesus, help us to see your word and your cross and your message. I want to set up today's message by referencing one of my favorite movies. It's on my top 10 movie list. Every family has a top 10 movie list. Do you guys keep that in your father-in-law's breast pocket right here? He keeps it on his person. Everybody's top 10 movie list. Uh, and on my top 10 movie list is Moneyball. <clears throat> great, great baseball film here. Kind of going back to the Oakland A's. Uh, we ended up beating, the Twins ended up beating them in the playoffs that year. But uh, kind of the saber metrics, the, the game is changing. And in this particular scene, what's being contrasted is kind of the old way of things versus the new way of things. The old way of doing things would have been with scouts, kind of chiseled, grizzled veteran scouts that sit every day at the ball field and they just kind of watch players come and go, come and go, and then use their instincts to, dis to decide whether that prospect has a future in baseball. The new way of looking at it was with statistical analysis, that there were all these stats that could get put into a computer and compiled and tabulated, and that might lead you to a new prospect, one that gets overlooked because they lack maybe some of the outward visible manifestations of, of what could go into a future ball player, and they just measured things that had previously gone unnoticed. The uh, scouts often talked about a five-tool ball player. Oh, it's rare. Oh, maybe they have three tools or four tools, but five-tool ball player, that's unheard of. Well, Brad Pitt, uh, playing the role of Billy Bean, was recruited with that kind of strategy. You're the five-tool player. And now Billy Bean is in the Oakland A's organization, and he's having a face-to-face -face argument with one of those grizzled old school scouts because he wants to update some things. And he's confronting this, this old scout about what you know and don't know about these prospects becoming future ballplayers. That's where we pick up the scene. Let me read for you. Billy Bean says to the, the scout named Grady, he says, Grady, you don't have special powers. You don't have the ability to look at a guy and just know because you're a scout with special powers. I've watched you sit at kitchen tables for years and tell the parents of a 17-year-old kid, trust me, when I know, I know. And when it comes to your son, I know. And then Billy Bean, Brad Pitt concludes, but you don't. <laughs> you don't know. It's all prospects. It's all possibility. It's all potential. You don't know. You sit there and you shove baloney down their face because you don't know. Now, that is an apt illustration, an apt analogy for where we've been this summer. We are looking at the parables of Jesus, stories that Jesus shares, right, to communicate things about his kingdom, about his rescue, about his salvation. Why? Because so many religious leaders are saying, we know what Messiah a fancy title for, for the, the coming one, the anointed one, the victor, the rescuer, the savior. We know what to expect when it comes to Messiah, when it comes to God's rescue. We know. Then Jesus comes on the scene and says, no, you don't. No, you don't. You're getting so many things wrong. But he doesn't just outright teach and direct. Many times he uses parables. He uses stories to try to draw them in to explore their ways of thinking and feeling, how they've conceived a Messiah versus the things of God that Jesus is saying, let me, let me throw a curveball at you because you're maybe not expecting this kind of rescue or this kind of salvation or this kind of Messiah. And so these aren't just stories. They're stories that come with Jesus illuminating the ways of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, God's work of rescue. It might 
be said. You could maybe put it this way, that on account of these parables, Jesus might say to the religious leaders of his day, you don't have special powers, religious leaders. You don't have the ability to look at a guy and just know because you're a religious leader with special powers. I've watched you sit at kitchen tables for years and tell the parents of a 17-year-old kid, trust me when I know, I know. And when it comes to the Messiah, I know. And Jesus says, but you don't. But you don't. So let me illuminate with these parables, with these stories. So with that, let me read our, our, uh, our parable for this morning, actually two, and then I'll give you an outline of kind of where we're going with the rest of our time. So this comes from Matthew chapter 13. The, the text will be on the screen as it is each week. For, for sure, you can open up your own, own Bible. If you got, if you, anybody bring a paper Bible to church this morning? Oh my gosh! Oh my, God. Wow! Look at that! Wow! Oh. I should have had something special for you guys, just like some sort of reward or something. Wow. I was expecting two, and I got like six. That's like three times more than I was expecting. All right, let me read from Matthew 13. Jesus put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fill, fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. So that, there it is. That's what we're going to kind of work through this morning. A little bit of where we're going. First part is just let's look at this kind of mustard seed and leaven parable, this story. Because he says the kingdom of heaven is like. It, the kingdom of heaven is not a mustard seed. It's like it, though, in some fashion. And so we need to just pause and say, how so, right? The kingdom of heaven is not leaven, but it's like leaven in some, in some ways. And so we have to just kind of look at that first. Then we're just going to identify and address this kind of these last two verses in our passage, this hiddenness piece. Jesus is going to speak in parables. Yes, it was forecasted. It was promised by the prophets that, that this would happen. And so in one way, Jesus is fulfilling that promise. But we have to ask the question, like, why? Why, why do it that way? Not, why not be more explicit? So we're going to look at that. And then we're just going to kind of ask and answer the question, how do these parables speak Jesus, speak kingdom of heaven to us here now, today? And I think it's really important for us to, at that point, just say, Lord, what do you, what do you have for me? Because it, it's fascinating. The number of times I stand down front and people are like, oh my goodness, that sermon was so great. It landed so specifically with me in this way. And then I'm like, can you tell me more? And they kind of talk about how the sermon hit them. And I, I didn't share any of that, right? So it's, it's, like, it's like Jesus is present here. Jesus wants to communicate some things to you, tailor some things for you. And so we want to just in that last part to say, Jesus, will you speak? Will you identify ways that you want to unfold this into my life? So that's what we're going to do this morning. Let's go back uh, and re-examine the, the mustard seed and the leaven. So Jesus puts a parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Okay, so I'm going to leave aside a lot of what commentators postulate and speculate about what this might mean. The mustard seed is this, the branches are this, the birds are this group of people. All right, Let, let's not speculate, let's just... Let's just pause, identify a couple things that we can know with a high degree of certainty. One is, uh, it's, it, the, this mustard seed, this, this grain of a mustard seed, it, it is small. Uh, 
it, it, in some ways, it's, it's quite small, but it's not the smallest. Like there, there are examples, we could find them of, of smaller seeds and, and maybe even smaller seeds that they would have widely known are smaller than this. And, and it's actually not the largest tree that could come about. So, so it's an interesting kind of parable and story that Jesus would put this forward when it's, it's not dramatically exceptional. It's not like, whoa, the kingdom of heaven is like this giant redwood, this giant cedar of Lebanon, this amazing tree. We're going to build this massive tree for it. It's like, no, it's just, it's just like a, you know, at full maturity, it's like an eight to 12 foot giant shrub thing. And you're just like, Wh- what? Like that's, that is the part that seemingly should catch us by surprise. That the kingdom of heaven is like this kind of plant, this kind of shrub. And so it's like, okay, it's not the smallest or biggest. It's not exceptional in that sense. But what it can do when full grown is provide shelter, provide nest, provide an opportunity, a place for dwelling of the birds. A lot of people speculate what that could mean, might mean. We're just told that the kingdom of heaven kind of operates in this fashion. Of all the commentators I read, Craig Blomberg, I think, uh, maybe says it best. He says, even large mustard bushes pale in comparison with the lofty cedar. Still, Jesus may be employing deliberate irony. What may not look like much to the world will in fact fulfill all God's promises. Jesus fulfilling God's promises. Entire Old Testament full of a lot of God's promises for provision, for dwelling, for safety, for rescue. And that's what it looks like? I I want a giant fortress, right? I, I want something dramatic, exceptional. And that's not what's provided. As Jesus is communicating about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, his rescue, his work in the world, He chooses an example of a mustard seed that in its full-grown mature capacity is not altogether exceptional or striking. All that compelling. Something so dramatic as to really remove all need for any kind of faith. (laughs) No, no, no. It's not going to be like that. And yet, most assuredly, it will fulfill God's promises. It caused me to think back to some examples, even in the Old Testament. If you remember, there was a time where, where God was bringing forth a judgment and, and yet it was communicated. If you, just, if you just take this blood from this lamb and kind of paint it on the threshold and the doorposts of your door, you will be rescued. To which you and I might think like, that, that's it? That, that little act of faith of, of taking this and doing that, that that's sufficient? That's enough? to provide for my needs, to to provide safety and rescue from the judgment that is coming? Yeah. Do you trust God? Do you believe him when he says this is sufficient, this is enough to meet your need, to bring forth rescue and protection and provision? Do you believe that? What about when blood is shed in a different light, in a different capacity, when the blood is shed at the cross, a criminal's cross? those who are looked down upon in society, those who are deemed thieves and therefore they are killed. Is that blood sufficient? Is that blood capable of rescue? If we trust in it, is God's promises fulfilled through that blood shed there? God doesn't give us all this exceptional, over-the-top craziness so as to exclude faith. But he does give us enough. He says, I I will fulfill my promises. I I will bring rescue. Let let this small mustard seed and what happens through that when full-grown, able to provide nest and shelter and provision for the birds, I'm capable of that. Do you believe me? The second example is of leaven. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Is there a Christian band? It just feels like, you know, with the rhyme of leaven heaven, that there would be a Christian band that would have stumbled upon that at some point here. 
right? The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leaven. <clears throat> so what can we conclude? What, what do we know? What do we not know? It could be said that this is a large amount of flour and okay. Uh, seems like, seems like the most readily obvious understanding is that the kingdom of heaven will permeate everything. <laughs> that, that there's not a, a, an aspect, a degree, a place, a circumstance, a time where Jesus in his glory, Jesus in his work, Jesus in his ministry will be prevented from getting to. This leaven will work its way all the way through his creation in the same way that a bit of leaven works its way all entirely through some dough. I want to quote from Robert Capon. We've utilized him at other points in this uh, sermon series. This is what he says. Here it is not simply that it is unadvisable or inconvenient or dangerous for us to interfere with the kingdom while the kingdom is doing its thing. It is plain, unvarnished, impossible. So intimate is the yeast to the entire lump. So immediate is the working of the kingdom to every scrap of the world that there is no way on earth of getting at it or even to it at all. Not for, not for the enemy, not even for the divine woman baker herself, kind of in an illustration, he kind of uh, uses this woman baker as, as God working with the dough. And certainly not for any odd little bits of the lump like you and me. What Capon says here is like, the, the leaven's gonna work its way through the dough. You can't stop it. I can't stop it. The kingdom of heaven expanding, working its way through this world and not even the enemy, not even our enemies are going to impact that. Who are the great enemies of the Christian life? Sin and death, not even those enemies. Not even Satan himself is going to be able to impede the work of God spreading through the world. So what we have here in these two parables, nothing altogether exceptional. A mustard seed growing into a mustard shrub, mustard tree, yet fulfilling God's promises. Leaven, nothing exceptional, doing what leaven does doing what the kingdom of heaven will do, which is expand and work its way throughout the world. So I want to pause just in, in, in a, bit, a little bit of a summary fashion, but also kind of expand out now to the, the broader scope of God's work in the world and just acknowledge the upside down nature of the kingdom of God. The reason that these stories of leaven and a mustard seed would surprise is because it does not fit their expectation what they are expecting from Messiah, what they're expecting from Savior, what they're expecting for rescue does not look like Jesus is communicating. Here's just a summary of some of the things that have, have taken place that we've communicated previously in this series, but are kind of true throughout the parables and just with regard to this upside down nature of the kingdom of God. It's often the case that the kingdom of heaven goes from hidden to revealed from a limited, right, a little piece of dough, a little piece of leaven, to being pervasive throughout. From scarcity to fullness. From inconspicuous, can't see it, it's hidden, to eventually becoming mighty, vibrant, visible. The kingdom of heaven works from a place of mystery to revelation. We're gonna see that in a, minute, a moment here. From a place of insignificance to great consequence, from despised to honor, rejected to glorified, from suffering to salvation, which is not a category that the religious leaders would have had. Why? Because our Messiah is going to win, <laughs> bring victory, conquer the Romans, cast others out. We're going to come back to the throne here in Jerusalem. Suffering? No, no, no. There's no place. We don't have any time for that. Final one, from death to life, from death to being raised again upside down nature of the kingdom of God. So many times when we think of religious leaders and what they expected from Messiah, it's in the right hand column. It's everything later in Jesus' ministry, future. But this idea of hidden, limited, scarcity, inconspicuous, mystery, insignificant, despised, rejected, they don't want anything to do 
with that kind of rescue, that kind of Messiah, that kind of leader. And honestly, like, don't we all have a little bit of that? Don't we all kind of like to be associated with, with winners in life, not, not like losers? Like, just, like, it gets hard to be a Minnesota sports fan. Why? Because we don't win, right? It's like, we, we win just enough to appease Midwestern appetites, right? But, but nothing is so consequential as like, we're champs. We get to, like, we're the champs, right? It's difficult, right? And, and by a great degree more, like associating yourself with this inconspicuous, ho-hum, limited, plain, ordinary Messiah guy? No. To which I come back to the Brad Pitt line. You think you know what Messiah is like, but you don't. You don't. So with that, let me, let me just ask the question, why parables then? <laughs> if it's so difficult for us to kind of wrap our minds around this kingdom of heaven, what God is like, what his rescue is like, why parables, right? Because at the end of our passage, it says this, all these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables, in story form. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. So, this piece of, uh, there it is. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. We have to just kind of ask the question like, what's been hidden? What's been hidden that is ultimately going to be revealed? What is the hidden thing within God's economy, within these parables, that is eventually going to be revealed? And in our New Testament, in our Bibles, it's very clearly God will make his rescue plan known. It, the prophets and other people wanted to know the details of that rescue plan, but it was only something that came forth in time. Even those in Jesus' age, even those in Jesus' inner circle were confused by these things. How are you going to do this? You say these things, but it doesn't compute. It doesn't click. It's not clear to us how you're actually gonna bring forth this rescue. How are you gonna save us if it's not by power, by might, by conquering the Romans? So, Jesus uses parables to start to explain these things. Look what it says in Luke 10, verse 21. In that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Why parables? Why stories? Because they are accessible for those with ears to hear, hearts that are open to receive what God is saying. Children can access this. <laughs> Even while the wise, the learned, the prominent miss it. Isn't that fascinating? If you speak of glory and grandeur, that's going to draw a certain group of people. And Jesus says, I, 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 actually, actually, that's not why I'm here. I want to I come and make myself accessible to all. And through stories, he says, you, you don't have to know all the deep theology. You don't have to understand the great depths of the mysteries of God and the big question. But, but I'm going to share a story that's accessible for all. Even young children can understand these things. Kind of reminds me, we've uh, done a number of escape rooms. My son's made a number of escape rooms. And it's interesting that, that some children are more adept at figuring some of these things out than the adults in the room. In fact, the adults actually complicate things, overcomplicate things. They're like bringing things in. It's like, wasn't there something about the Byzantines that, and you're like, what is that, right? My sister-in-law actually put together uh, uh, an entire uh, periodic table. She assumed we just need to know the atomic weight, the atomic, like the number, and I'm gonna figure it out. It's like, no, 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 no. 
You shouldn't assume that people can figure all that out. In an escape room, in a darkened escape room, they give you a periodic table. They're going to give you a little bit more. And she was over there just figuring out. And she did figure it out, but that shouldn't be assumed. Why? Because we all don't know the numbers in the periodic table. We need a little bit more help, right? And just, it's this piece of like, is the kingdom of heaven accessible? Or is it so beyond us that we have to have this just immense knowledge of all? No, no, no. Can, can you see this and understand these things of rescue, of salvation, of God working in the world on your behalf? Another example of this, uh, if you just move forward in the story, Jesus is actually being more explicit towards the end of his days as he's approaching the cross and he shares pretty explicitly with his disciples about what's to come. This is what he says. Taking the 12, he said to them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the son of man by the prophets will be accomplished for he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them and they did not grasp what was said. Even as Jesus has continued to be more explicit about how his rescue is going to come together, it's still lost on them. Why? It just so defies their expectations of what rescue and salvation are going to look like. They want to be triumphant. They've associated themselves with Jesus at great risk. And it's like, now's our time, right? And he's like, yeah, now's our time. I'm going to go die. What? These things were hidden from them. Ultimately, even after Jesus dies and is raised, he's communicating to a couple guys as they walk along the road. He said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That suffering and even death are not outside of God's rescue plan, but actually they are central to this victory, to this rescue, to this salvation. So it is that Jesus dies, bringing forth this great salvation, and in that, parables end. I think that's really important for us to know. Parables end when Jesus goes to the cross. What was spoken of in story form, in obscurity, we are now given the cross. We are now given Jesus' suffering, his death, his resurrection, to see things with greater clarity, greater understanding. So it's this, in this fashion, right, that do we know? What do we know? We know Jesus' death and resurrection is the glasses that we can see through, look through. It's the LASIK. I got LASIK. LASIK? LASIK? Life-changing, right? <laughs> Jesus' death and resurrection are the great LASIK that allows us to see clearly, okay? <laughs> we thought we could see clearly. Why? Because I want big, demonstrative, very clear demonstrations that God's powerful. And then Jesus comes in weakness. And now we take that death and resurrection. We go, oh my goodness. Even in weakness, he shows his strength. Even in death, he shows his victory. Even in his suffering, he brings forth rescue and salvation. So I want to just ask now and answer the question in our remaining time. How, how do these things speak to us in our everyday life? I'm going to share five things. If you already have something, that's great. That's God. That's between you and Jesus. And he's sharing stuff. That's awesome. Here's five things that you could consider in light of these parables. How do these parables speak Christ, speak Jesus to us in our everyday life? First one, be okay not knowing all the things. Like be okay. Like be at ease, be at rest, not knowing all the things. Like Think through the last week or the last month or the last year, how consumed you and I have been because we don't know all the things. Don't you have questions when it comes to the leaven and the, the mustard seed? Like, well, what about this? What, is the mustard seed my faith? Faith in my community? Is, is the leaven bad, good? Is it, is, it, is it about my trust in the leaven working? You know, like there's all these questions. Like, no, 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 no. Don't go there. Just be okay not knowing all the things. 
And some of you are deep in theology. You read the books, you read the commentaries. You want to know all the things. Or some of you are consumed with knowing the future. What's going to come next week, next month, next year. Are you okay not knowing all the things? And that Jesus' death and resurrection is sufficient, is enough. Are you okay not knowing all the things? I want to quote from a guy who experienced Jesus' touch, his healing. Blind from birth, and Jesus heals him. And the religious leaders got a problem with that. And so they follow up with the guy. So for a second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know this man, this Jesus is a sinner. And he answered, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know that though I was blind, now I see. I I don't know all your religious tricks and quizzes. I don't know what tests he has to pass. I don't know what qualifies as an appropriate Messiah, as a good enough Messiah, as a victor, as a savior. I don't know any of that. I was blind and now I see. Are you okay? As you sit there this morning, are you okay with what God has shown you, with what God has revealed to you? He stopped speaking in parables because he's given us the cross. He's given us his resurrection. That's the hinge point of human history. That's the most consequential reality. Are you okay? Is that enough? Secondly, do you believe that Jesus' death is the doorway to life? It's unexpected. Nobody thought victory would come through death. So many of his disciples thought it's over. Do you believe that his death is consequential for you? That that bloodshed for you results in you experiencing life, resurrection. Not just, not just a change in behavior, not even a change in belief, but, but truly a transformation that you were dead and then Jesus makes you alive. This idea of the, the seed becoming something else, being transformed, Jesus actually uses that regarding his death and his rescue. He says in John 12, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus' death being the thing that dies and brings forth much fruit. It is upside down. It's unexpected. But do you believe this? That his death is the most consequential reality, not your work, not your faith, not your spiritual habits, not your church attendance, not your small group participation, not the compassion you have for the people in your life or the acts of service. All of that might be worthwhile. But ultimately, this is the most consequential reality, that a seed fell, that a seed died, that a seed was buried and brought forth great fruit. Do you see how the onus is not on you and me then? It's not on our present work, our present actions, our present robust faith. I have just tremendous faith. I'm going to move mountains today. No, no, no. Jesus moved the mountain of sin and death. He cast it in the sea and he brings forth life. John Calvin says, uh, John Calvin's an old dead guy that says this, by these parables, that's all, just ref- that's, you can refer to me someday in that way. Just this old dead guy uh, said this one time. By these parables, Christ encourages his disciples not to be offended and turn back on account of the humble beginnings of the gospel. We see how haughtily profane men despise the gospel and even turn it into ridicule because it is not instantly received with applause by the whole world and because the few disciples whom it does obtain are, for the most part, people of no weight or consideration and belong to the common people. The Lord opens his reign with a feeble and despicable, and he kind of in, in air quotes there, feeble and despicable commencement for the express purpose that his power may be more fully illustrated by its unexpected progress. Do you hear what he's saying? That those in this room that have trusted in Christ are of no weight or consideration. <laughs> He's being offensive towards you. And yet, it is where we need to be. That's our posture of humility and saying, if it weren't for God, if it weren't for what Jesus did. It's it's nothing exceptional. 
It's never going to get worldly applause. People aren't going to line up. But there's going to be a few that hear this and say, I believe. Jesus, I trust in you. I need you. Your death is the doorway to life. Third, don't despise the common and the ordinary. Don't despise the common and the ordinary. This is what is said in 1 Corinthians 1. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Jesus grabbed on to two really base, common examples here of a farmer and a homemaker. Common, ordinary vocations, doing common, ordinary things. And Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven can be seen in these things. And and by extension, in your common, ordinary, everyday life, God is at work. Some of you have vocations and you go like, man, me so different. If I was a doctor and I'd be just rescuing people and saving people, the common, ordinary, everyday life, Jesus says that work there in those places. The kingdom of heaven is like those things. Don't despise. Don't look down on the common and the ordinary in everyday life. As you consider your vocation, your career, as you consider the relationships, your friendships, your family, are you tempted to believe that God's not there, that he's absent? He only shows up in the flashy, in the special events. Like, no, 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 the common, the ordinary, the everyday. Jesus is at work there. It's not about the wisdom. It's not about the strength. It's not about the flashy of the world. For don't despise the unseen and the slow. The examples he gave were of unseen things happening in the deep recesses of heart and mind and life, deep within Not always visible, not always tangible, not always obvious. But don't some of us just struggle with that? You look at your own faith, your heart, your life, your relationship, and you think, I just thought I'd be better, different, more godly, less given to sin and pettiness and anger. You ever think that? You ever just have that like, I just thought I, you know, wouldn't need Jesus as much as I do. I just thought after five years, 10 years, 20 years, I'd be better. I kind of have it all figured out and cleaned up by now. Jesus working in the unseen and slow ways. John Chrysostom, who happens to be another old dead person, uh, little by little, it transmutes the whole lump into its own condition. This happens with the gospel, little by little, bit by bit, common, ordinary, unseen and slow. This is the way of the kingdom of God. Even if you look at your own life, It's typically of incremental. Maybe there wasn't a significant event and moment. There are those. But so much more in the common, ordinary, unseen, slow. The gospel is not flashy, but it is pervasive and it will prevail. Slow, bit by bit, day after day, drip, 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 drip. One more. How do these parables speak Christ to us? Be okay not knowing all the things. Believe Jesus' death is the doorway to life. Don't despise the common, the ordinary, the unseen, and the slow. And finally, await God's future fullness. Await God's future fullness. It says in Habakkuk 2.14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. It is a certainty. It is unavoidable. It will happen. The whole world one day will know God in his fullness, in his presence. And until that time comes, we wait. Now, if you add up all the verbs that I just gave to you, right? What are you to do? What are you to walk out here? And pastor says, I got I to gotta do these things. Be okay not knowing. It's amazing how we might struggle with that. Be okay. Just be okay not knowing all the things and how much that a struggle that is for us to just not know. Believe Jesus' death is a doorway to life. Don't despise. Don't look down. Don't, don't 
look with disdain towards the common and the ordinary. Don't despise, don't look down on the unseen and slow ways that God is moving in your life or the life of your small group, the life of your family, the life of your church. And await. There's a lot of passivity in those verbs. Why? Because God's the principal actor in all these things. He's the great victor. He's the rescuer. He's the savior. I'm gonna close with a capon quote. He says this, when we think of the subject of response to these parables, to God's work, especially with regard to sacred subjects, our inveterate Pelagianism, great band name. Uh, what, is, what is Pelagianism? Our tendency to think that our own moral efforts are necessary to the plan of salvation. That's inveterate Pelagianism. It leads us to set up scenarios in which the work of the kingdom simply will not go forward without your and my cooperation. And that's not at all what Jesus is communicating in these parables. This seed will bloom and fulfill my promises and provide shelter and warmth and compassion for you. And this leaven will work its way through the dough. Does Jesus need your and my cooperation, our help? No, 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 Jesus says, I got this. This is gonna happen. So what are the only responses you need to offer to the yeast in the dough or the seed that becomes a mustard tree? Well, patience for one thing and possibly discernment, to be able to recognize when it, not you, please note, has done the job, and maybe a little vigilance to make sure impatient types don't talk you into despairing of the lump before its time comes. But no matter what you do, the yeast works anyways. Here's the five things that I mentioned. Might there be one in there that God would encourage you with? Might there be one that God would want to speak to you through his spirit? Might God want to just say, hey, 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 that one right there? Will you trust me with that? Maybe some for the first time, you've never considered Jesus' death as a doorway to life, as a doorway to rescue. You believe it has come through vocation or money or career or stuff or things. Will you trust in Christ, and maybe be okay not knowing all the things. In humility, not knowing all the ways that God wants to work in the world, all the answers to the questions of life, to the whys and wherefores of your life, of your specifics. This is the upside down nature of the kingdom of God. Just a little, just, just a little bit of trust, a little bit of faith in this rescue, in this salvation. God says, that's enough. I can use that. Believe in me, trust in me in these things. We have clarity, not on account of us knowing all the things, but on account of his death and resurrection. He is certainly gonna bring forth fulfillment of his promises. Do you believe that this morning? We have the chance to sing a couple songs of worship, to be prayed and to pray and to be prayed for, to give if you wanna give to boxes in the back or online, to take communion. This little cracker, this little juice, reflecting Jesus' blood, his rescue. Do you believe that? Do you trust that he is able, through his body broken and his blood shed, to save you? It is upside down. It is contrary to the world's teachings and different philosophies, which says you must achieve, you must do, you must accomplish the goals you set forth in life. Rather, Jesus says, are you okay enough with this? Might not look like much but I'm saving the world through these things. Do you believe that? If you believe that, you can come take communion. You don't have to be a member of our church or any church. If you wanna be prayed for, we would love to pray for you. Anything going on in your life, big, small, common, ordinary, seen, unseen, doesn't matter. Anything and everything, God takes concern over in your life. I wanna invite the worship team forward. I'm gonna close this in a word of prayer here, but we can keep praying. We're gonna keep worshiping. Keep looking to God and his victory at the cross for us. For all the things we don't know, that death, that resurrection is certain and it is mighty to save. Let's pray together. Jesus, thanks. Thanks for gathering us as a church to be reminded of these things. These are things that I need to hear. Uh, we need to hear this morning. That ultimately it's not the flashy, 
the strong, the most intellectual, the richest that usher in your kingdom. Admittedly, God, we might not know all these things. We might not know all the answers. But one thing is clear. You have died and been raised. A seed has gone into the ground to be buried, to produce fruit. Oh God, how I pray that each person in this room is trusting in your death, trusting in your rescue. God, be lifted up in this remaining time as we pray, as we worship, as we take communion, and as we give. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.